Now, uh, in the cavernous reaches of the underground of Actors Theatre of Louisville, it's uh, actually known as the Starving Artist Restaurant. It's a combination eating place and saloon and entertainment hall, and it's in the basement of the Distinguished <coughs> Actors Theatre of Louisville here. I'm Milton Metz, your host, and my guest tonight is the my friend and the gifted producing director of Actors Theatre of Louisville, John Jory, uh, who's uh, brought a, a fascinating luminance to uh, to the city of Louisville. You know, John, it, it has always been customary for great theatrical events, f with few exceptions, to take place on the coasts, uh, in New York on Broadway, in Los Angeles and Hollywood, that magical word. But suddenly, and uh, I say this advisedly, you almost single-handedly have made Louisville an actress theater an international word. Why? Why Louisville? How has it happened inland, in Jefferson County? We're not, you know, we're not extraordinary in many ways. We are a, a very pleasant place. The quality of life is good here, but why Louisville? Well, first of all, Louisville has been always extremely hospitable to the arts. Uh, the great European traveling companies used to come up the river, and this is one of the American cities that they stopped at, and I suppose partially it's, it's history. I think for another reason is people want what they get, and this community seems to want the arts, and not only want the arts in general, a lot of cities want to make sure they have their ballet company and their opera company and their theater company, but there seems to be a thirst for uh, quality. Uh, every time we've made a qualitative advance, we've been applauded, and there's been a nice pressure to get better. And I think that pressure just combined with a great deal of affection and, and warmth that this city uh, produces makes the difference. Seems to me that Actors Theatre of Louisville reflects you to a great extent. Uh, you were not the first founder of this no, theater, no. but it never really got off the ground and became nationally as well as internationally known. And I don't want to make you uncomfortable by all these compliments, but it's true. It's a matter of public record that people come from all over the world to see your uh, parade of new plays, for instance, your, your distinguished uh, repertory theater company here. But I think you have shaped it in your image through more than hard work. Hard work won't always do it in the arts, will it? No, that's, that, that's certainly true. Uh, I always say, as a good friend of yours, my father, uh, Victor Jory, and my mother, uh, who was also an actress, my sister, who has acted. I think a lot of what I know about the theater just was plain old osmosis. Uh, uh, some, of the, some of the time, I wonder why certain things seem to go well when I'm directing, and there really are no answers for that. Uh, you know, I suppose like any other uh, talent, and I don't say that with, uh, it, it seems divorced from me personally, I seem to be able to work successfully in the theater, moving people around on a stage and, and talking about plays. And it is one of the few things I do successfully. <laughs> I play a good game of ping pong. Uh, but I think one of the things, advances in most fields are made with people, by people very often with a pretty narrow focus. And uh, whether you're lucky or unlucky, I tend to be able to do this one thing a whole lot better than I do anything else. Can you be a good director and dislike actors? No, that's utterly impossible because no. it's communication you're talking with people and sharing with them and they have their own ideas and a lot of times their ideas are a hell of a lot better than yours so that uh, 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 it has to be a sharing I, I don't know what else it could be I, you don't do it you suggest and edit they do it uh, I was reading uh, uh, an interview the other night by a conductor and I, I forget the name oh I know it was Andre Previn who was saying that, uh, he said that one of the most embarrassing moments in his life is, was at the end of every concert where he had to come out alone and the orchestra would leave the stage. And he said it always struck him as a little bit ludicrous because what did everyone suppose he was going to do with his little stick if the orchestra didn't show up? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that it's, I mean, we're, I'm, I work in a, uh, uh, a team art and as such, you've got to have affection for each other. It's the only way it can work. But directing styles do change. There are the tyrants, aren't they? They're the, the men who are authoritarian in, in their directing. Uh, they humiliate actors and somehow get good performances from them. Well, I gather that's not your style. Well, I, and I don't think that's an American style. There's a tradition in Europe uh, for that kind of, uh, for the authoritarian director. And I notice in my travels in Europe, 
that European actors seem quite comfortable doing absolutely and precisely what they are told. Uh, as you and I both know, that's not an American trait. Right. Uh, and American actors tend to bridle or simply withdraw when confronted with that kind of personality. So I don't think it just has to do with me. I think it's a national style. I tend to think we share the process a little more than maybe they do in some other countries. One of the remarkable things about Actors Theatre of Louisville is the high quality, high consistently quality of the actors that you've assembled here. Now, it would seem to me that in your journey through the theatrical world, you would know a couple of leading men, a couple of ingenues, and that when you got your troupe together, you thought, oh, I'm going to hire them. These are good people. But season after season, you get dozens of players, and certainly you can't know them firsthand. My basic question is then, how do you, how do you know your selection process? Uh, why does, uh, is, is, is the correct one that you turn up so many winners on your, on your acting? Uh, That's a complicated process. I suppose it's like asking uh, a basketball coach uh, his or her recruiting habits. Uh, you have your own well, eye. You, in that, you say, I'm going to give your uncle a good job, <laughs> and you're seven feet tall and come be on my team. <laughs> That's right. No, height is probably not the key in acting. Uh, but uh, uh, I think a lot of it, when I look at an actor, there are, are a couple of very simple things I look for. I look for intelligence, uh, which is necessary. I look for warmth, uh, a personality that gives and, and is willing to share. I look for a sense of humor because uh, the difference between, very often, between a good actor and an ordinary actor is the ability to see the humorous sides of otherwise very difficult situations in our life. It gives balance and richness uh, to the work. And then you look for ordinary things. There has to be tremendous physical ability, the same kind of hand-eye coordination that you need uh, with an athlete, you need with actors. What their mind does, their body needs to reflect. And uh, you can see that almost immediately. I mean, I always enjoy watching you because you have that kind of physical connection. In other words, I can, you can see it in people's face. You can see it, how their body responds to what they're thinking. And you see that almost immediately in an actor. And then Even some, under audition circumstances? You can see it pretty quickly. What you can see in auditions is very simple. You see very clearly the top 5% of the talent. You can see immediately the people who are wonderful. The people who are good craftsmen, but perhaps not enormous talents, you can sometimes make mistakes about. You either thought they were better than they turned out to be, or you didn't think they were so good, and later on you see them do something else and they surprise you. But we work pretty consistently with the top 5% of the developing talents in the country, so you can see that kind of work very quickly. That's a key word, developing. Now, one of your most celebrated actors, maybe the most, is Susan Kingsley, who's internationally known for her performance in breathing true art into Marsha Norman's play, Getting Up. Recently come back from an overseas tour in a dozen of the major capitals. She told me now she has been in movies, she's known internationally, she's made a real name for herself, that she started at a very lowly position here. I think she was a non-actor. She was uh, with her husband, Pig Farmers, in Frankfort, Kentucky. Uh, started in the box office. In the here. box office. Now, you saw something in her that helped develop her into the great artist she is today. Well, you'd love to take more responsibility for other people's success uh, than unfortunately you can. Uh, Susan was working in the box office. I, I knew that she had studied some drama in college, but that's all I knew. And one day she said that she was going to be uh, uh, trying, uh, competing for a scholarship to one of the major English drama schools, uh, the London Academy of Dramatic Art, and would I assist her? And I took a few minutes out and saw her work on the stage, and she was obviously talented. Uh, it was, uh, you could have put 500 people in my profession in that room, and they all would have known she was talented. What did she do for you, John? Uh, she did a piece from Shakespeare, I think from Comedy of Errors. Just by herself? Right, by herself. And. Uh, I worked with her some, and she went off to London, and she came back, and I saw her again, and she was again vastly improved. And then she began to work in roles with us, and role by role, she was just plain old getting better. I think what happens in that case is theaters like ours and people like myself are not responsible for people's talent. Uh, what we are responsible for is creating an instrument, in this case a working theater where plays are going on in the evening, where that talent can fulfill itself. 
I, I, I would like to claim more credit, but I think you would have had to be um, extremely, uh, uh, you would have had to be blind and deaf not to recognize this particular talent. It was just there when it appeared. It had a long way to go, and it did grow. One wouldn't think of somebody, I, and there's no reason they couldn't go from Frankfort, mm -hmm. Kentucky to the Royal Academy. Were you surprised that she, she had uh, enrolled or had been accepted? Well, that's part of that old thinking that, uh, uh, that, uh, that people in the arts uh, either come from or must settle in uh, various urban areas. That if you're not from uh, uh, downtown uh, Chicago uh, or midtown New York, there's no talent there. It, it's, it's an obvious untruth, and the talent is everywhere. The chances for development are what make the difference. You know, when you were saying <coughs> these things go on in New York and they go on, they go on on the coasts, you said, which, which is extraordinarily true. The nice thing, one of the reasons that we're getting better theater all around the country is just that eventually they're running out of jobs in those places, and the talent keeps coming. And when I came along, I, I looked around at the opportunities, and I thought, gosh, I can go there and spend three or four years looking for work. That's what you do when you finish your training. You don't work. You look for work. As a matter of fact, looking for work is a profession in my profession. <laughs> uh, and uh, I did some of the looking for work, and I noticed that you know my hands were always uh, wet, and my eyes were always slightly unfocused. I was just a nervous wreck. And I thought, uh, gee, I'm not bad at the working, but I'm perfectly terrible at the looking for work. Right. And so I thought, I'm just not going to do very well in this circumstance where it takes three years' worth of contacts and endless auditions and going to see people every day. And so I thought, I'll, uh, I'll go where they'll let me work. And by letting me work, the, Louisville, you know, I've done Louisville no favors at all. Uh, what's happened here is Louisville has a provided me with the opportunity, much as I might have prov provided Susan Kingsley with an opportunity to work. And during the time they let me work, I've gotten a lot better. And as uh, I got better and the people working here got better, the theater got better, and that's what happened. I mean, Louisville is responsible for the development of this theater in the same way that we might be obliquely responsible for some of the talent that works here. The juries are near near Barrymore in, the, in being a theater family. Your dear late mother, Jean Innes, very active in the theater, a lovely person, a gifted actress. Your father, Victor Jory, who's moving toward 80 and shows no signs of diminishing in his enthusiasm for the theater or for life. Your, uh, your sister, Jean. Uh, Jean, has acted, you acted. Growing up in that, it seems to me that you would go in one of two ways. Either it would be the move farthest away from acting, or as you did, be thoroughly imbued in it. Do you, did you get something in genes, in environment, that equipped you a little bit more than the person who moved into a, from a family that wasn't theatrically? I'm, I'm a shoemaker's son, and, and instead of learning it, I absorbed it. I think that's the difference. Uh, I had difficulty when I finally in, when I went to college and began taking acting classes and theater classes, I, I had some difficulty because I, I couldn't understand that process. I'd gotten it while I was growing up, sitting around watching some of the best actors of my father's generation doing their work, you know? And so I had a hard time learning from books about the theater, and I think that's probably a problem. You probably have the same thing if you're a good butcher and you come from a, a family that butchers, <laughs> and then they stick a book in front of you about how to butcher, and it just seems to get in your way. You already have the tennis strokes, right? Did, did you have a lot of famous people in and out of the house? Well, we had some people. You know what was interesting is that they never, uh, they, they may have been famous to someone. They were never famous to us. They were the folks that my family knew. Uh, now, this is not to say that we were entirely naive. I remember later on when I was, uh, 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 when I would be attracted to a girl, sometimes I would uh, make sure to take them to a movie in which my father happened to be appearing. It's not that you don't ever use this, you know. But uh, it was a pretty unconscious atmosphere. I mean, this, everybody did something on our block. Some people were lawyers and some people were retailers. And we did this other thing. And uh, it didn't seem highly unusual to me. Although much of your directing has to do with serious plays, you seem to have a strong point in directing comedy. Physical comedy, your bits of business have been excellently reviewed. It's always exciting 
and very busy to see one of your plays on the boards. You have an antic sense of humor. I've known you. I, I think you have a lively sense of humor, and I think that contributes to this kind of staging. Does it appeal extra much to you? It, n no, not extra much. As a matter of fact, whatever you have sort of a natural talent for, you usually try to move away from. You always say to yourself, oh, I know I can do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> then you want to do something else. You know where my physical sense came from? Boxing. Uh, uh, I really believe that an enormous amount in the theater of the kind of physical sensibilities that work in terms of timing are really apparent in, particularly in individual sports like tennis, boxing, those kind of things. I did a lot of boxing when I was a kid, uh, you know, just... Uh, uh, that's right, your dad was a boxer. That's right, and, and, and he encouraged me to do that as a, as a sport I was interested in. And I'm really convinced that most of my t timing for the stage comes from that experience. Uh, I, I know it didn't work out quite as well for Muhammad Ali, but uh, <laughs> I noticed that he wasn't quite able to transfer his boxing skills into the theater. But uh, uh, I, think, I, think that, I think a lot of that is just that. It's a physical sense. I don't know where else it comes from. And a sense of humor, my, my, uh, my family uh, all had a, had a good sense of humor. And uh, 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 sometimes I think we had better have a good sense of humor. Speaking of that sense of humor, has there been anything really horrendous happen on the stage that has either sent you into gales of laughter or terrible despair? I mean, you I'll know, tell you what, you know, I with, started out doing a little bit of acting, and then I got away from it because I wasn't very good at it. And uh, years ago, in a play that I was directing, one of the actors fell ill. And the actor who fell ill was the absolute bane of the technical department's existence. Uh, he was a very dashing actor, but somewhat clumsy, and he would wander around the stage making sweeping gestures and knocking off ornate goblets that had taken hours to make onto the floor. So he wasn't terribly popular. Well, I had to uh, replace, I'm sorry, I had to replace another actor, and I was playing a scene with the actor, the, the, the clumsy, dashing actor. And uh, in the middle of the scene, he did this again and knocked to the floor an entire tray with several props. That and in front of 500 people, I'm supposed to be acting now, I said, oh, Walter. <laughs> but I thought I called him by his name in front of 500 people. It shows the directors just can't get away from their trade. <laughs> uh, I guess worse things have happened. Uh, has that a, a flat ever fallen? Oh, sure. Well, we had, a, we had an experience here where uh, not only did a flat fall, we had a revolving stage uh, set within a larger set. And it went off the tracks. And it took uh, uh, a large, uh, uh, it went off the tracks and took a large portion of the set with it. It just went through the set the way a taxi cab might if you drove it through stage scenery. And there was this terrible crash. And it was not immediately obvious. I mean, the play, I knew the minute that happened, the play could not progress, but the actors were game. Yes. They tried to think of something to say and something to do, and it, and it was kind of fading away gradually. And so finally, I was standing at the back of the auditorium, and I finally just walked up on the stage. The actors were still trying to act. And I stood up and said to the audience, I said, I, I'm terribly sorry this has happened, but we're probably going to have to take about an hour memorial intermission for the set. Oh, <laughs> Listen, we were sp you were talking about impressing girls. Did you find your wife in the theater? Yes, I found my wife in the theater. I, uh, she... I don't mean in the lost and found. No, no, not in the cloakroom. <laughs> Uh, I was working in Pittsburgh, and she was, I was guest directing there, and uh, uh, she was acting there, and she was a great distraction to my work process. So I followed her around long enough until she knew she couldn't get rid of me, and then things worked out. I've seen her. She is a distraction <laughs> to any right-thinking man, uh, John. You're quite right. Your, uh, your troupe, uh, Actors Theater, has won what in, in, in thoroughbred horse racing would be the Triple Crown, the Antoinette. Uh, the Tony, the Award. Tony Award, plus the two others that that uh, no regional theaters ever won. All three of them in one year. You have done that, and that's why I didn't think that was hyperbole in the beginning when I said that you're known internationally and and have such a spectacular show. Your your troupe also recently returned from uh, a state uh, sponsored trip overseas to Ireland, to Belgrade, Yugoslavia, to to Israel. Uh, now, when you start getting beyond the borders of America, and you're talking in non-English speaking countries, how then does art, now Picasso could be understood in Spain, in Paris, in London, in America. How does American uh, playwriting 
transfer from one nation to another? Varies. In Ireland, they loved it. They could identify with it. You know, it's a play about a woman who was just getting out of prison in her first couple of days out after this happened. Uh, in Ireland, they were terribly enthusiastic. Uh, I understand, though I haven't, uh, I was uh, not with the portion of the trip that took place in Israel. It went extremely well there. Yugoslavia, they were very quizzical. Uh, they said things to us afterwards, like, how do the American police view this play? They said, um, uh, where does this violence come from in the American character? We don't have any of this violence here in Yugoslavia. Uh, they were fascinated by something, I suppose it was very much like Louis Williams watching the Peking Opera. You could get the acrobatics and the juggling. Right. When they got down to the serious singing, it was very much from another culture, and you didn't know how to relate. And we found some of that true in Yugoslavia. They were taking it a little differently than we intended it, and it was fascinating to share ideas. Uh, art doesn't always travel any better, as, as you know. I mean, there are artists that other nations do not admire who we admire. I'm talking about visual arts. Right. Uh, who we admire, and it's just uh, so much because of those cultural differences. You're, uh, I think uh, wh what you hope for, in some countries they'll identify, in other countries they'll just be interested, and interest is enough. You talked of speaking to the uh, audience afterwards in Yugoslavia when you were there. One of the charming things you do here at Actors Theatre is, in, on many occasions, is to talk to the audience, yourself as the director, or your father, Victor Jory, or some visiting star or one of your representatives talks to the audience, not at them, but talks to the audience after the performance. There's an exchange. Sometimes there's even a discussion mm -hmm. of the theme of the play, which seems to me sort of a bonus to the, to the viewing of the play itself. Well, it's a bonus to the viewers and it's a bonus to us. You know, it gets to be a, a pretty isolated profession. You do the play, people applaud. Now, you've heard that before because they do it every night, and then everybody goes home. And you never get to talk about what you did and, and, and what people felt about it. So we do that not as some kind of uh, public relations hype, but as an opportunity for it to be more valuable to us as well. Uh, uh, it, the, the great pleasure, if I may say this while we're working for television about the stage, is that uh, everybody is in fact alive. And when you're alive, you get to do a little chatting. I, I'm somewhat amused about this new form of communication where you can press a button and vote yes or no on your television program as to whether or not the criminal was guilty. I don't think it's exactly the same kind of communication. Do you know what I mean? And that communication is what makes the theater special. And we'd be crazy if we didn't want to do that. One of the extraordinary things that actors have done since time immemorial is to take parts in plays that have had no basis in their own background. An actor takes the part of a brain surgeon, a crazed neurotic in an insane asylum, uh, a wayward prostitute. And maybe the actor has no experience in that at all, and yet the gifted actor breathes tremendous life into it. It is amazing how they do it. And my question is, how? How in the hell do they do it, Jim? Well, everybody does it differently. Stanislavski, the great Russian theorist, says, if you're playing a murderer, you have to find the same emotion somewhere in yourself. You need to find, you may not have done anything about it, but at some point of your life, you have probably been angrier than at any other time, and it could have possibly resulted in some sort of physical event. Maybe not a killing, maybe you just hit someone. But you have to go back and try to remember those circumstances, which may have that kind of anger, and apply it to the role while you're playing it. Uh, uh, other people, I think, uh, uh, I don't think do it uh, intellectually. I think they do it intuitively. Uh, they just have a sense, a larger human sense about them. I mean, I could ask you the same question. You seem to be able to ask uh, uh, specific, accurate, uh, professionally knowledgeable questions about an extraordinary range of professions in the world. I know some of it's research, but some of it's Intuition. Right. Some of it's just made dumb and, uh, <laughs> and wanting to find out what's going on. Well, that's the same way an actor works. <laughs> it, it is. It, it's a magical craft. And the actor used to be, they used to feed him in the kitchen in the old days, didn't they? Listen, it is a magical craft. I was thinking just before we left on our European tour, we were doing our final rehearsal. And Susan Kingsley, who had played this particular role in getting out hundreds of time, and she's quite tired of it, uh, 
jokingly, as she made her first entrance, said to a totally empty auditorium, I think there was one apprentice sitting there for this final run-through, said, I would like to tell you that this is my final farewell American appearance in this role, she said to the non-existent audience. Yes. And then she proceeded to give this absolutely extraordinary performance for no one, Milton. In other words, she was giving this, this was her final performance in America, she was never going to play this role, and there was one person in the audience, one. And she gave a performance that people would have happily paid $75 a ticket to give. And uh, it is that kind, she was doing this thing for herself. And that's one of the things about great artists, is we happen to be privileged to be there while they're working, but in a sense, they are doing it for themselves. And that's still magical in a world where everybody is trying to sell something to somebody else. Uh, in this case, things happen all the time. I see in rehearsal, and I would think, nobody's ever going to see that. Wasn't that extraordinary? Uh, and it was shared among four or five people in a room. And it is still that deeply human, very small, isolated, simple experience that I think makes the arts extraordinary and, in your word, magical. And it can still raise the hackles on your neck? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love, I love the theater, and... Uh, uh, I feel privileged to, uh, to work in it, and uh, I, I can't imagine doing anything else. And I'm one of those people who is just extremely fortunate uh, that their work is their play. I've, and that's, uh, uh, that's the nicest thing that can happen John, to John, what's going to happen to you? An actor's theater. Louisville. I'm just going to keep on doing it. Uh, <laughs> keep on trucking. I'm going to keep on trucking. If you like what you're doing, sometimes the, all this goal-oriented um, uh, stuff can get you in trouble. I mean, you've won this award, and now what are you going to do? The point is you win the awards because you concentrate on the work. And luckily in the theater, there's always another play coming up on the runway getting ready to take off. And so as long as you stick with the work and you enjoy the work, then you'll get a lot of the side benefits if you're doing good work. Uh, and uh, sure, you have to tell some people about it, but first of all, you have to concentrate on the work. That's what I want to do. I want to do this some more. Imagine you do too. Yes, yes, that doesn't seem to be enough to do. And uh, it seems to me that as we talk here in the basement in the Starving Artist Restaurant and Saloon, that the walls are alive and that you use almost every room in this place. And I thank you very much for being our guest oh, today. Thank you. As a friend and someone I look up to in the theater. Our guest has been on Bywords today, John Jory, the producing director of Actors Theater of Louisville, known internationally for its fine work, its great performances, and its recognition of new American plays. I'm your host, Milton Metz.